This presentation is brought to you by the collaboration between the Center for Teaching and Learning and the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. So if I could just pause for a second and get a thumbs up from everyone who is ready, willing, and able to engage in the work today and excited. I just want to see thumbs up. That would be great. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. This is also my way of making sure that people are actually listening to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. I appreciate you so much. The system that we'll use for the majority of our conversation today is Nearpod. So I'm sure many of you have used Nearpod before, but it will give us the opportunity to see folks as they post their comments, their questions, things like that. Um, before I plop the, the link in the chat, I wanna say this. You do not have to put your full name on your sticky note. When you log into the, to the learning session today, if you would like to just put an asterisk or a plus sign or an equal sign or a dollar sign, whatever you feel motivated to do, if you're not totally comfortable putting your full name, please feel free to do so. Some of the questions that we'll ask, uh, that I will ask, I say we a whole lot, but you know, this is just my way of showing you that this is all collaboration, all partnerships. So I say we a whole lot, but it's me. <laughs> um, if at any point there's a question that, that um, probes you just a different kind of way and you want to log out and log back in and change your name or you know put a name next to it please feel free to do so um, this will be an opportunity for sharing for uh for processing together and hopefully we will learn some things from each other and we'll be able to take it and inform our work moving forward so what i'm going to do right now is put the link in the chat box and then if you can click the link I'll end up sharing my screen so that we can see the full board as people are putting their, um, their comments on. But we'll start there and I'll wait to see as names start to pop up or persons start to pop up in the, in the box. Let me know if you're having trouble. Oh, it's so good to see everyone from so many different areas. This is good. All right, 15 folks in so far, let's keep it going. So did anyone want to volunteer to first start, start us off? What does diversity, equity, and or inclusion mean to you? Would anyone like to unmute? Specifically in higher education? Doesn't have to be. We, and, and if you would love, if you can, you can give us both in general and how it relates to, to the work that you do. Well, I, I think within our department, it would be breaking down the straight white male like canon that had always been perpetuated in, in teaching about photography. Mm -hmm. And that would be the equity piece as well. Right, okay. right. right. Got it. Yeah, I love that. Any other thoughts? Diversity, equity, inclusion. Yes. Oh, this is Anita Flemington. Yes. Um, I look at diversity as, as we, we are a diverse campus. So it, equity is not equality. So what we have to do is include or inclusion, which is what I teach to my teacher ed candidates. The inclusion will help us get to the equity. So we take each student where he, they are at and then, then that's where we start. That's how I see it. Thank you, Anita Chinieri. Um, I was thinking about the spread of things, multiples, so that the group becomes stronger mm -hmm. by having multiples. It's not that without one, you wouldn't be strong, but somehow the multiple enhances the whole. Thank you. Who else wants to chime in and share? Well, I'll, I'll chime in. Uh, being, uh, good morning, everyone. Being a business professor, one aspect uh, that I think of with diversity, equity, and inclusion is just um, all the possibilities for innovation that have been kind of left on off the table. There's just so much strength in women leadership, in diverse leadership, mm -hmm. and um, how can we 
how can we change that so that we have all these pearls that are not, you know, being added to, uh, you know, the possibilities of products, services, how we do things. So I just think of it as such a great opportunity to um, innovate because customers are diverse. So, um, and I know that sounds a little businessy, but you know, it's part of the equation too, in my mind. No, I love that. Thinking about our customer, mm -hmm. our students, right? Right, 100%. Yeah. They're not really customers, but it's a, it's a way we do serve them and we yeah. do provide a service, so. Any other thoughts on these words, these terms? This is some good stuff. I would love to hear if you've ever um, heard the terms used in the wrong way. And you're like, I don't think that's what that means. Uh, I don't, I don't know that that, yes, Andrea. Hi, good morning all. So um, I think when I think about diversity, I think about like multiple perspectives, multiple peoples, right? But I think sometimes people will refer to institutions as diverse if they're, if they have like 90% of a particular group that tends to be an underrepresented group, right? So if we had a Hispanic serving institution, which we identify as, right? I'm not up to date on our specific numbers, but let's just say theoretically, we might have 75% or an institution might have 75% students that identify as Latina, Latino, Latinx, that wouldn't necessarily be diverse from that specific perspective, right? We could look at within group differences and get at diversity. But I think oftentimes people will use diverse to mean students of color, but it doesn't necessarily, it's not being um, necessarily um, representative of the multiple diversities that can exist within that group. Yes. So thank you, Andrea. There are a couple of things that I'll say um, before we kind of transition to the next question. One of them being diversity being considered more than just race and ethnicity. So a lot of times we gravitate to the race, the ethnic, um, even the skin tone, the skin shade, color, things like that, right? Um, but there are so many aspects of diversity. We could be talking about um, a social identities where it's the religious background affiliation or um, LGBTQ plus their sexual orientation or their gender identity, or we could be talking about uh, their, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> we, could, we could be referencing um, a lot of different things, whether or not they um, have interest in different ways, how they were raised, their socioeconomic status, what they are bringing into the space. These differences should all be respected as diverse and valuable. So there are a couple of things that we think about. Okay, diversity, we talk about it as in numbers, the presence of, as long as we have the presence of these differences in the space, that means we're diverse. Well, are we? Well, let's talk about it. Like in what ways are we diverse? So understanding who we are, who's in the room and what they bring into that space. So that's more than just saying, oh, I can look at the screen and say we're diverse because it looks like we could have some shared identities. It looks like we could have some differences there. What about taking the moment to say, who's here? And how do you identify? And what are you bringing with you? That's when we move from diversity to considering what equity could look like and what inclusion could look like. Equity then goes on to say, how are we being sure that our service, the service that we provide, the teaching that we provide is actually reaching and able to reach the persons that we're targeting, the population that we're looking to engage? So what does that mean? I need to make sure that my students or the people around me are at the same level. I don't want to enter into a space to say everyone deserves the same thing when there could be three people in here who have never heard the term diversity, never heard the term equity, and never heard the term inclusion. So we can't jump into a conversation around those things without first saying, how can I bring you to the playing field and help you understand where we are? And if I can't help you understand, what resources can I provide for you that'll help level that out and, and give you a fair opportunity to also win in this space, to be able to contribute to the conversation, to be able to engage in a way that everyone else can, right? The last piece, when we talk about inclusion, for me, this is all about the person that I'm looking to include. 
So at no point can I say that I have been inclusive if I have not engaged that population to say, did you feel included? Did you feel that my actions, my attempt to engage with you, my attempt to make sure that you were heard and seen in this space actually worked? If I don't hear from the persons that I am looking to include, then am I really being inclusive? Have I ever tapped into saying or tapped into this population to see what their needs are? Did I meet those needs? If not, what could I be doing more to make sure that they feel that connection, that they feel that sense of belonging? I think Brian's um, uh, tag said, had the circles where it was like diversity, equity, inclusion, and then belonging all in the middle overlapping. Because really, if we're doing all of these things, if we're considering the numbers, if we're considering the differences in the space, if we're considering how to make sure that they have a fair and, and equitable opportunity to be successful in that space, and then we're making sure that they're receiving what we're giving, we can have all types of ideas. They can be stellar. We know they can be. But it might not be the way that that person needs to engage. So instead of it being a personal thing for me where I'm so stuck in my ways that the only way that I'm going to facilitate this conversation, the only way that I'm going to engage is the way that I see fit, that means that I haven't given an opportunity for the people to really feel included. Right? So inclusion, all of these things overlap if we're doing them right. If we're doing them right. So I'm going to pause for a second and see if anyone has thoughts comments, questions about these words, these terms, and the way that we use them or the way that we, we talk about them. <laughs> I heard someone <laughs> use the term Jedi. Yeah, I can always talk. Um, so, uh, and I liked, I thought that was hilarious because they included the word justice. Mm -hmm. So um, I, you know, I think there's like always another level, another acronym we can create, right? Another, uh, but it speaks more to like the future and accountability aspect to it, I suppose. Thank you. Winona. Hi, um, you can hear me, right? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so um, I have a question, you know, uh, because Bell Hooks passed recently and I was rereading her book, um, Teaching to Transgress, and she talks a lot about um, engaging students in the classroom and getting them to speak and, and really making them speak. Um, and so I'm, I'm feeling uh, a little ambivalent about that, right? Because um, I really tried to engage students last semester. And it, it, this is a stats class, so it's a little bit harder to get conversations going, but I try. Um, and it was really, really difficult really difficult and, and I tried a technique where you know I'll go down the roster and ask each student to try answering a question um, and and it was just more difficult than it had ever been in previous semesters and so um, you know I feel ambivalent about that because on the one hand I want students to speak I want them to feel comfortable speaking in class um, on the other hand with the pandemic and, and all of the mental health issues that students are experiencing and anxiety, um, I wasn't sure you know, how right it was to really force people mm. to speak up in class if, if that caused a lot of anxiety, like real true anxiety. Um, and so I'm trying to figure out like how far I push that. Um, you know, One idea was to maybe have students write something down and share it with somebody next to them. Um, but I guess how far, you know, just struggling with how far I push people to speak, mm -hmm. if, if pushing them to do that is really gonna cause like real anxiety for them. So I, I'm trying to find that balance. So any ideas <laughs> would be great. Oh, thank you, Winona. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, there are a couple of things that have happened over the course of the last two years that we have to be sensitive to. The transition to virtual learning, online learning, the transition to folks really having to um, settle in and learn in different ways that they didn't necessarily know that they would have to. Um, I the the terms force and um, you know make people do 
that's that's the terminology we may want to even step away from. How would we better encourage and create a safe space for students to feel confident to share? And that could be multiple modes of communication. So are we giving them platforms like a collaboration board where they can plop in in the chat or post a post-it? Or if it is something where you partner them up with three persons or something like that, making it where there are multiple opportunities where it's not, oh, unmute yourself and speak because it can be intimidating. It can be overwhelming for students to do that. So how am I engaging? Now, one of the things we talked about in the last DEI series, one of the, one of the things we talked about was early on, what do we do to find out, number one, who's in the room, how they learn best, and how can we best create that opportunity for them throughout the semester? So maybe this is also an opportunity at the beginning of the semester to say, let's talk, let's do some cue cards, let's write out some things. This, I best learn this way. I'm a horrible test taker and I know this about myself, so I might need a little support or I do better with check-ins bi-weekly. Do you have office hours? Like creating a space where the students can actually upfront say to you, these are my strengths that I know of. And these are some of the areas that I know I need some support in. And I don't necessarily like speaking out loud. If this is a public speaking class, is there another way for me to engage? Can I do a collaboration board? Can we do a post-it note? Can we do something in Teams, Microsoft, like a chat box or something along those lines? If we're in person, can we, can we do a Kahoot? or some type of engaging activity with our cell phones because we know the majority of them have them, but we don't wanna make that assumption that all. So different ways to engage. Am I creating that opportunity in the classroom? And instead of feeling like I'm forcing them, now I'm creating a space where they would feel more comfortable to engage. So that's just one, one thought. Did anyone else have something to, to add that they can encourage Winona with? I was going to speak, but um, it was not necessarily related to what Winona had, you know, um, was addressing more. It was more related to what uh, you, Alexandra, were talking about a few minutes ago about, um, you know, are we really asking ourselves the questions? Am I providing um, everything I need in order to the, you know, for the student to feel included and mm -hmm. to make sure they have their voice, you know, being heard? And are the activities that I'm providing, you know, for the lesson, um, are they, you know, scaffolded? Do they have enough variety, um, you know, for, for them to be able to say, yeah, the teacher saw me, the teacher heard me, um, you know, through, through the lesson. Um, so that was the part that I was going to share before. But then I, not but, but in addition to that, <laughs> I should say, you know, when you started talking about the uh, speech class, you know, th this is a, you know, speech class and, you know, this is the way we engage in this class, but at the same time providing alternate activities. Now on that one, I'm a little bit puzzled, right? Because we still have to honor the rigor of the class and the expectation, the overall expectation of the class. So if the goal is to make sure that the student learns how to speak in public comfortably, you know, how much do I need to scaffold without taking away from the ultimate goal. So I, that one I did struggle a little bit with. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. So I use that example. I'm not sure, I, I didn't hear Winona say what class she teaches. So that could be me um, missing that, that point of her comment. But when I use that, that comment, it was to say, unless this is something like a public speaking class where you're required to. And even in that setting, there could be alternates would you create an opportunity for a student to only position or perform in front of you as the instructor first, and then allow them to space the space to do small groups? Maybe we start off with a one-on-one -on -one where the student does their public speaking or their, and, and if we're talking about accreditation, if we're talking about um, standardized testing that they'll have to do afterwards, there are certain things that we have to make sure we do within our classrooms. We know this. We have to make sure that the students are proficient in certain areas to make sure that they'll be successful when they leave us. That's our, that's our job, right? To prepare them to be successful, right? 
So, but in this, in this event, what else can I do? If we're talking about public speaking, can I provide an opportunity for the student to first engage with me as the instructor alone and then do small groups where they're only presenting in front of two or three of their classmates as opposed to a classroom of 30? Just thinking about that, where we help folks feel comfortable as they build that confidence to speak. Um, not saying that they won't get to that point, but just really being creative and stepping outside of our comfort box. I've taught it this way forever. This is how I'm going to always teach it. We, we, I'm, I'm encouraging us to step outside of that. So I hope that helps to clarify that point. Okay. Thank you all so much for that dialogue. I love this. I love this. Okay, so the next question that I had was in regard to your teaching and your service philosophy. So um, many of us had to do this fresh out of college, maybe to say, this is the way that I'm going to approach my work. This is the philosophy that I live by when it comes to teaching in my service area. I would love to hear from you or see um, some of your philosophies. This is what I live by as it pertains to my teaching and my way of engaging in my work. So I'll give us a moment to do that. Yes, valuing what students and others bring to the educational space. I love that. Yes. I love the collaboration, the, the lifelong learning, allowing a safe space for respect and engagement. This is good. Would anyone like to unmute? or raise their hand to chime in, to just talk through the way that your philosophy has evolved over the years. And this could be one, just evolution as a professional, but I would really love to hear whether or not diversity, equity, and or inclusion has been considered in that evolution process. Yes, Melissa. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Um, so for me, it's a little different because I'm not in a classroom. I'm more on the student services side. And I also come from a background in business coming into higher ed. So just to give that perspective. Um, coming into higher ed, it was very, I know what I'm talking about and this is where you need to go, was a philosophy. <laughs> and I have wisdom that I wanna share with you. But at the same time, I've had to learn over time that like our students bring cultural wealth with them to this campus. How do you help them understand that it has value, use it to your advantage, grow it, learn and explore because they're at an age where the world is their oyster. So go ahead and dive in and learn something new, meet new people, gain new experiences. And through that practice, they'll start to see diversity, equity, and inclusion where it's needed, where it is, where it isn't based on just uh, living life, growing and participating. But I started to learn, especially through like master's program, and now I'm in a doctorate program, you really have to connect with people and humanize the experience. It can't just be about this particular target being hit, this particular thing having to be met, how do you help them grow through it? I learned even through certain sessions, it's not just about the A, somebody with the B could have learned so much more and offer so much more than the person who just knew how to took the test. So I've had the opportunity to grow, to learn that and see, give people space to tell you what they know, what they're interested in learning and how you can connect all of that together. Love it, thank you so much. Others want to talk to us about your philosophy, how it has evolved and what your thought process has been there. Yes, Laura. Laura, are you there? Oh, there you go. Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry. Um, one of the, I guess the main learning over the 15 years or so of my career is having, having started in the professional higher ed sector almost immediately after having been a student in the higher ed sector, there was definitely um, sort of a rosy lens on a lot of things. And one of the things that has sort of caused those to fall away is that very real reckoning that institutions are not neutral. They are made up of people and culture is embedded into the way that we do things and the shape of the work that we do. 
And in a lot of ways that's good and that's healthy and productive. And in a lot of ways that can be really detrimental um, and can be exclusionary toward those who are not part of that sort of foundational culture that that institution came out of. So in order to bring about any kind of equity, there has to be a concentrated effort towards a cultural shift. And it's going to change policies and it's going to change the way you approach things. And if it doesn't, then you might not be doing it right. And you might be unintentionally continuing to exclude people. Um, and as a sort of piggyback onto that, that I've found the only meaningful way to get uh, that input from folks about, you know, not just have I met your needs, what do I need to do to meet your needs, is to provide them the opportunity to come up with their own ideas. What would meet your needs? I'm not, I'm not gonna know everything about your experience and how it makes it difficult. So for those who are neurodiverse, for those who are English as a second language learners, those folks need that opportunity to say, this is what my experience is and this is how I best learn and how I can best contribute instead of being told, well, here's what I'm going to do for you. Thank you, Laura. Luis. Yeah, um, one, one thing that I've been um, emphasizing to my students lately is that um, things that I teach, like for example, management to undergrads, and I, I try to tell them, it's the art and science of management. So the science of management you're gonna be exposed to in the course. The art is who you are and what you bring to the table. And we're gonna do as many assessments. You're on this lifelong journey to discover who you are and you wanna lead from who you are. And I give them examples of you know the introverts uh, and the neurodiverse in Silicon Valley and how our whole thinking has changed and how that has brought so much strength. So. Um, you know, I try to get them to understand they get to bring who they are and that's going to transform management um, and, and specifically because they are diverse. So that that's kind of been working for me to remember that, you know, the art, because I think sometimes we focus too much on the science of, of things, but there's also the art, who we are and what we bring to the table. I love that. Thank you all for sharing. Um, this is really good. And I appreciate, yes, Christine, we'll, we'll give you space. Christine. Sorry, oh, I know you were ending that segment. <laughs> no, uh, we're good, go ahead. Because science was mentioned, thanks Louise. Uh, I wanted to share that I've learned over the 20 years of doing similar work that there is room in the science uh, for relationship building, for uh, you know, employing cultures culturally sustaining practices and getting to know students. Um, and it's been a sort of a battle to, um, at the national level to have that be accepted, but there, there is room and there are things, small things even that I can do um, in my classroom that creates a more welcoming environment that capitalizes on the the cultural capital that my students have and that actually enriches the classroom. So it's a myth, there is room in science. I love hearing how um, we are taking the opportunity to create those spaces that we're listening to our students, that we're actually being sensitive to the, the, the difference in culture, what they're bringing into the space and that we are okay evolving. I think um, part of the problem is when we get stuck and we feel like we've grown as much as we can possibly grow and there's no room for, for change or evolution. And that's when there's a problem. So I appreciate everyone talking about the journey that they've taken and what they've taken into consideration as they continue to improve on their philosophy. I encourage others who have not necessarily done much work with their philosophy or even thought it through. Like, what is my philosophy? I don't know that I ever sat down and, and thought that through. What is my teaching or my service philosophy? I encourage you to do so and ensure that the way that you're approaching your philosophy and your work means that you're being inclusive and that you're considering equity within that process and that you're considering the diversity within the room and, and within the population of people that you'll be serving. So really wanting to, to encourage you all as you um, continue on that journey. So thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing. Um, I'm gonna skip past the next question since we are, we're having good dialogue. 
great dialogue. But I wanted to specifically talk more. Let, I want to see some examples. DEI within the classroom or service area. How do you see that in action in your area of service? So if you can give us an, an example of a way that um, you have made sure that it was present within your service area or your classroom, that would be great. And I would love to hear from folks. So as you are working on your sticky notes, if there's anyone who wants to share with the larger group an example, that would be great. I'll share. I'll share real quick, only because I think I have a, an easy um, answer um, because of the content I teach. I teach the Laverne and Experience 305, which is precisely this, uh, you know, diversity, inclusion, and equity. And I do remember, uh, you know, one time um, one of the professors, professors asking me, you know, who you know, who are your students reading? And, you know, I gave the name of the book that I'm using and the comment back was like, hmm, interesting. That is written by, you know, the, um, I just don't want to be offensive, but, you know, a white author. Have you considered other authors that could be writing the same topic? And um, I thought I was being diverse. I thought, you know, because of the topic of the book, you know, it, it's great, you know, we're already addressing this in class, but that was a huge eye opener for, for me because it was something I didn't consider. It was a blind spot. I, I never thought of, you know, whose materials am I using? And through those materials, am I only providing one lens and, and one perspective? Thank you so much for that. I'm gonna just pause really quickly and just, put a plug out there for some of the other sessions that are happening this week. There is the, the syllabus audit um, tool and assessment piece that Dr. Sylvia Mack will be doing later this afternoon. It's really helpful if you had some other thoughts about what other areas of my syllabi or my course could I look into with an equity lens and make sure that it's inclusive. Um, please feel free to chime in there. And I also, one of the, one of the books that Winona mentioned, um, Teaching to Transgress, that was one of our DEI book club books. Um, within the last couple of semesters. So if you're looking to engage in different ways to read things like that, to learn different ways that we can approach our work, please join us in the DEI book club or the No Nonsense book club or any of the book clubs there also. So I just wanted to put that plug out there. Any others want to share your um, examples of how you have ensured that DEI was in your area of service or in your classroom, please. These are some good examples too. I, I could share. Um, so this is Gerard, and I'll, I'll share an example from from my field. Um, so I teach French, and when I was first trained to teach French, we had a program where everything was oral, so nothing could be written down. We wouldn't write anything down, and the students weren't allowed to write anything down, so that they would learn from hearing and speaking, and it was deemed to be the most effective. Um, and since then, things have changed, and I, now I realized, you know, that that was wrong in so many ways, because maybe for a lot of people learning through, you know, speaking is the best, but there are people who need to hear, to write it down, they need to see it written, and, you know, so I take that to heart now, and, um, you know, I make sure that, you know, that, you know, if I give a lecture that there is, you know, a written copy that I'll write anything down, um, so that's an example, I think, of just dealing with different modalities of learning, that I don't think we used to always take into account. Thank you, Gerard. Any others want to share an example for the group? What I hope this is doing is showing how it is possible to integrate and consider this equity lens, an inclusive lens within the sciences, within the social art, within the social sciences, within art. Like there are literally ways to do this in every aspect of our work. And so I am hoping that with these examples, which we will share later to all of the attendees, I'll make sure to send out these things so that you can take a look at it later. I hope that it kind of probes you to say, am I doing my part in my area of service? Yes, Daniel. Something that came to mind was whenever I engage with students is that they're obviously coming into the space with what is most important to them in terms of their identity. And a lot of times they're not thinking about, you know, both myself, but they also are not thinking about the wide range of diversity that others are walking into the space with. 
And so I think um, always to be attentive for myself to, to um, how folks are walking into the space and what is most important to them in terms of how they're walking in. And, and, and I know that, you know, it's sort of like their worldview, that's their lens that they're seeing everything through. And so I remember uh, one time being real surprised that there were some students that were, were adamant that, that sexism, racism was not the issue. It was actually, it was actually SES, it was socioeconomic based. And they were talking about, you know, from their lens, it was, it was all about um, classism. You know, it was all about how life experience uh, brought folks together and, and it was wanting that, them wanting to, to sort of retain that. And that was impacting everything else. The intersectionality was around everything else, but it had, it had its foundation in, in classism. And, and so it was a really interesting perspective at how it really, um, you know, how folks walking into spaces and what's most, most burning for them as an area of passion to address. But I think for them, they're blindsided then to the other issues often. And, and I think for them to understand that for others, they're not even in the conversation around class. They're, they're talking about, you know, sexuality. They're talking about a lot of other things that are most pertinent and relevant to them. And so I think just to be attentive always to that. Thank you. Considering all of those aspects when we, when we approach this work. I appreciate that, Daniel. Thank you. Okay, any other final thoughts before we move to our next question? Awesome. So how comfortable are you on your journey? Like, do you understand this concept? Are you okay advocating for equity and inclusion? Um, are you seeing some things, but you're not quite sure how to call it out within your department, within your area of service, within your program? How, how comfortable are you? Let's do it like this. On a scale of one to 10, with one being not comfortable at all, and 10 being, I am a rock star. Tell me where you are, and then leave a little note as to why you feel you're in that place. I appreciate some of the things that I'm seeing. Well, I appreciate all of what I'm seeing, but specifically those things about even breaking it down to say, I'm comfortable in my understanding, but I'm not quite there about in speaking out and advocating. I'm not there yet. Or I've, I've gained an understanding. I'm more sensitive to different cultures. I'm this, I'm that but this is an area that I'm still working on. The reason that I'm asking these questions is so that we can really take a look. Have I ever even sat down and thought about it? If this were to come up in the classroom, if this were to come up in a department meeting, if this were to come up in a staff meeting, would I feel comfortable enough saying that's not okay? Um, and we can go as far as if a microaggression is spoken or if something, something offensive is said, or, you know, we can talk even on levels of like that. Am I comfortable enough and confident enough to say, that's not the best way to approach this conversation? Like, how are we in that? And I want us to say, be honest with ourselves and say, I have a lot of, I have a lot of work to do. I'm not there yet. I'm still growing. I'm still learning. There's always room for growth. There's always more to learn. Um, the reality is we their term, terminology changes every couple of years. So there'll be another term that we'll have to learn. There'll be another term that we'll have to grasp and figure out how to integrate it into our work. But, or there'll be another way that we can approach conversations respectfully. Like these are, these are things where we, if we're on this journey of continuous improvement, if we're always open to development, then, then we know that we're growing, we're learning. Um, yes, the Harvard Implicit Bias Test has many different areas. Um, Julia just, Julie just popped it into the, the chat. Um, this along with some of the other ones, if you, if you wanna go to the diverse, if you haven't been to the diversity page, um, I list resources, I add to them all the time. We also do a 21 day racial equity habit building challenge that provides um, recommendations for articles, for books, um, videos to watch, TED Talks, things like that, podcasts to listen to in ways that we can continue growing. 
sometimes we don't know the areas that we're lacking until we tap into them. So hopefully this is an opportunity for us to still um, learn more about ourselves as we're continuing to grow in our work. The Harvard implicit bias test there, I took one full disclosure. It was um, on the gender roles. Um, and I was kind of floored by what came out. It was like me saying things like the man should be doing this in the house. And, and I was like, Oh, did I say that? You know, it was, it was me having to really take a look at myself. Like, am I holding people to these, these, uh, this normalized gender roles and bias in that way. And clearly there was something in me that was still struggling in that area. So once I realized that I had to be a bit more conscious, like I can take the trash out. I do it all the time. I live alone. So why would I even answer the question like that? Right. So then it was, it was more work that I had to do in self. So the, the bias test is really great. There are multiple different areas that you can go through that talks about ability, um, sexual orientation, gender identities, gender roles, things like that. So really good. Um, if you want to take a moment to do that, but I wanted to pause for a second and see if anyone wanted to share about their journey um, and what they're feeling or how they're, how they're progressing um, on their journey to be more culturally agile. That would be great. Anyone feel like sharing? It sounded like someone unmuted, but I couldn't tell who. So if we're okay, um, I'll just say again, this is your opportunity to do a self-assessment, to say, I know that there are areas that I still struggle. I want to acknowledge those so that I can be better individually. I can be better as a person and that I can be better in my job, that I can better support, that I can be a better neighbor, be a better brother, a sister, like really honing in on what areas do I still need to grow and how can I continue growing? So thank you for your participation on that. Okay. Uh, there's, uh, yes. um, Julia Wheeler. Oh, here. sorry. Yes, Julia. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to, um, that Harvard test was really confronting. <laughs> um, and I have heard from uh, black folks, brown folks, it doesn't matter, we all carry this inside. And so it's, um, it's really interesting because um, I think I am a certain way and who's running the show? Uh, and so it's just, it's just really good to see. And so, you know, I do a lot of DI, DEI work in uh, our community, Laverne, not uh, the, the university, but in the city. And I mostly all the time start with like, I'm doing this work and um, I'm moderately racist. According to this test, I'm not even like slightly racist. I'm moderately racist. And I, like, I just have to put it out there. Like, so like there'll be things I say and do perhaps that kindly, please tell me, kindly, please tell me. Thank you, Julie. You're a rock star. You know that I, I tell you that all the time. <laughs> so I appreciate you sharing your journey and being a light for the community as well. And Cassie, that's awesome. Um, Louise had a question in the chat and I am gonna pause for a second to see if anyone else does anyone use the Harvard implicit bias assessment within their classrooms? If you could um, share that, that would be great. Um, so I did wanna keep us moving. I, I don't want us to be, to miss any pieces of this, but recognizing engagement differences. Um, so how well are we able to recognize the difference in performance within our students? And Sometimes this is something that we ignore or we say, oh, they just might need a little more time or, oh, like, no. Are we noticing patterns? Are we considering whether or not our approach is equitable? Are we being sure that the students or the people that we're working with, so this doesn't necessarily have to be in the classroom, this could be within our area of service too, but are we sure that they're coming to the table with the background, the knowledge, the tools, the resources to be successful? So are we able to notice this? And then what happens when we do? Just a question. If you have any thoughts on it, please share with a sticky note. And we would love to hear someone speak aloud as well. 
Dr. Oh, Burrell, I can speak a All little right. bit about this. Yes, please. Uh, hi, everyone. So um, my name is uh, Dr. Andrea Reyes, and I'm the Director of Accessibility Services at ULV. And I this you know, question definitely spoke to me because um, I see it with my disability services perspective. Um, I see the wide range of students with disabilities and just how every student is a different type of learner, right? So when I'm having those conversations with my students, I'm asking them, well, what type of learner are you? Have you discovered? Are you visual? Are you audio? Um, do you need to write things down? And have those conversations with your professors so they understand when you're talking to them about accommodations, check in with them and so that I, I definitely see right away as a staff member as well. Thank you. Perfect addition. Andrea, yes. I think it's important to keep in mind that our students come to our classrooms with different socializations and different um, experiences around self-advocacy. So I've had students who feel really comfortable reaching out and being like, can I please have an extension? I have X, Y, and Z lined up and they'll preemptively ask and other folks who balance a myriad of things in their lives and have not been socialized to ask for that kind of, kind of treatment, right? And so it's always interesting to me who's who's willing to speak up and who's not. So I try to spend a lot of time cultivating voice in students so that they can feel empowered to self-advocate, um, you know, beyond the classroom as well. Because again, you know, people are coming with different histories and we need to remember that and support our students so that they can be successful both in our classroom and then what's beyond as well. Yes, I love that. Thank you so much. These are great ways that you can engage. Um, that you can get to know the room, that you can understand who you're working with and how you can best support them. Um, Andrea Reyes is our new director of um, accessibility services. So if there are some things that come out in your classrooms or in your service areas where you can encourage a student to connect with her office, perfect. Um, but we don't know those things until we ask. If we notice something is different, if we notice that they need some support, Let's do our part. And sometimes we can't do it personally, but we can connect them with the resources who can. So if I'm not capable of handling it myself, I can reach out and I can make sure that this is um, an opportunity to connect some folks. Yes, Melissa. One thing that um, comes up as a question for me around this is, do our students even know that there are some differences? And the reason why I ask that question is, kind of to Andrea Minkoff's point, um, we're asking them to develop voice and they've been socialized. And one of those socializations could be just keep going on, just be resilient, just keep moving. And how do we help students even understand? Because I think like when I'm looking visually, this is the smallest board of responses that we had in the group. And it's not a critique, but I also noticed the amount of time that it took us to respond to I was sitting here thinking about it like, how is that present for me? And it first question that comes up and it keeps coming up is, how do we even recognize what that is if we don't necessarily have the expertise in this area to help a student then garner that voice to see it? I love that. Thank you so, thank you so much for that. So um, Elva, before I come to you, I'll just say this. I'm, I'm just gonna um, toss this in there. One of the ways is once we notice that difference that we start the conversation. So I think we avoid it often because it is the unknown, because we are not familiar with it, because we don't understand totally how to engage and what to do with it, we avoid it. Like, no, let's actually open up the conversation, create that space where the student feels comfortable to say, listen, something's going on, or if I can say, I noticed some differences in the way that you're approaching your work now. You, you didn't show up to class or like, it's okay for me to have that conversation with them because I care um, in a respectful manner, in a caring manner. And the reality is I don't know every resource on the campus. I don't know every term that's used, especially when it comes to neurodiverse learners, especially when it comes to accessibility differences. And so because I am not as privy to that information, I know what to do. I know who to call on my campus to say, 
I had a conversation with a student and I would really love for you to sit in or even engage in some dialogue here, or can you help me? And so I think that starting the conversation is the first piece of that. And if we can start there to even talk through with the student to say, if you're struggling, if you're having difficulty, there are opportunities and resources that can help. Sometimes they feel like they're, this is it. Like, this is the way that I operate. This is the way that I work. Nothing's wrong, right? Well, it might not be wrong, but if there is a difference where we can help improve and create that opportunity for you to be successful, that's what we want to do. So even having framing the conversation about success and and continued progress is great. Um, Elva, sorry. Um, so I work with um, students in advising, and oftentimes um, they come to me when things are not working in the classroom, and it's kind of gone on longer than what they, you know, they weren't able to tough it out like what they thought. Um, but what I try to do in the space that where I have them, um, first and foremost, I think students need to realize that they are cared for because you can have all of the answers about your expertise and make all the appropriate referrals, but if students don't know that you care about them or that you don't remember anything about them, they're not going to want to ask you for help and they're going to see that they're going to get the perception internally that they are an inconvenience to you. And so uh, one of the things um, that kind of guides my ability, like that guides my work in doing this is um, I, am, I relate a lot to my own experience because I am my, these students. I am a low income person. Student. My parents didn't finish high school. I'm the first person in my family to have a career um, and doing things differently than the rest of my family. And I think they need to see that the problems that they're going through or the decisions and conflicts that they're having with their families or about their life are things that other grown ups have. And, um, and when you can normalize that and put a human face on it, then it kind of breaks the ice for them to kind of maybe go against some of their cultural norms or their familial norms of not asking for help and not putting one's business out there. Thank you. Uh, we'll do Anita and Andrea. <clears throat> I'll be quick. Um, I was taken by what Melissa said. Um, as, as someone who teaches in the teacher education program, which is graduate program, I'm sometimes shocked that there are students who have come all that way and are undiagnosed. And I think that that is something that we need to address and that we need to maybe have something to, to show individuals who are not in the education field what that looks like. There's another thing that's, um, I used to assign a book called Grit. I no longer do that. Um, I have some issues with it. Um, this is a book, it's called Authentic Cariño. And it's something that we're using in our book club for teacher education. And it's Authentic uh, Cariño Transformative Schooling for Latinx Youth by uh, uh, Marnie Curry. But that, it, I was taken by what uh, Elva said also. Cariño, which is caring, um, is, is really something that even if we don't always have the knowledge, if we have the caring, that's going to help but guide us to that right place. So I wanted just to share a little story um, around cultivating like voice. And so when I was in my first graduate program, I remember we went to a colloquium and no one in our lab spoke. And I remember when we got back to like our little lab group, the professor I was studying under kind of was like, none of you talked. And we were like, well, you know, and, and we were a lab of predominantly first generation students of color. And our professor was also a woman of color one of the first in the UC system to receive um, step 10 promotion and tenure. So really well respected. And she basically told us, she was like, people sacrificed incredibly for you all to have a seat at this table. So she connected it to our larger kind of group identity. And she's like, you need to really cultivate your voice because there's going to come a time in your lives when you're going to have to advocate for others, for yourself, and you need to be comfortable utilizing it. And so I really appreciated how she drew it to 
of things that were bigger than us. And it wasn't necessarily like sharing, you know, your, your personal business or anything. It was just really asking questions about methodology, practicing, having ownership of being a member of that learning community and space. Um, but I, I appreciated again, how she tied it to things that were bigger than us. Right. And so I think that that was, and, and I'm super introverted. I don't like to speak publicly, but just in that moment that gave me the courage to say like, okay, I need to start exercising this as uncomfortable as it may be for myself because it can have an impact for others. So I think that when we think about cultivating voice, there's multiple ways that we can do that. But I've always tried to tie it to something bigger and more collective for my students in that process as well. Love it. I need to say no more on that. That literally put the bow on it. And so I really hope that with this, we are a bit more intentional um, with creating that space of caring and trust and safety where we can have the conversations with the students and encourage them to advocate for themselves, to understand where they are and then advocate. So I appreciate you all sharing. That was amazing. We have two more questions. I'm gonna try to um, clump this into one. So personal or professional development and engagement. Um, what are you doing outside of the classroom to help you move that spectrum? So that journey of cultural agility that we talked about before. Um, so like a workshop like this, maybe, or maybe like Julie mentioned, um, her work within the community. I'm interested to know what are folks doing to help grow in the area of diversity, equity, inclusion, um, just to show that the importance isn't tied to oh, you know what, I have to do this for my job. And so I'm going to do this one hour, submit a summary, and then I'm done for the year because I've done my part. Are we engaging outside of that? Are we doing more? Would you be interested in more and what that looks like? So let me just kind of pause and say that the very last side slide is asking about what areas you need support in. So I'm hoping we'll get there before our time runs out, but um, I wanted to make sure if you, if you don't get an opportunity to say what you need support in, please include that in the box. And you know, I love to hear from you all. So if someone wants to unmute and share, please do so. Nice. Alexandra, I have a question. I'm, I'm sure maybe you guys have already started this work and it would be very beneficial uh, for us as professors to have that information. Um, have you collected information from students uh, who have shared what is it that would help them to feel included and heard in the classroom? Um, not just from their racial cultural background, but also from their gender um, identity. I think it's important for us to uh, kick off, a, you know, a, the semester or, you know, start from the beginning, taking that input from the students and sharing with them, this is what I know so that they know we're interested and invested, but tell me more. How, how do I make sure that you feel included in, in this class? What else can I do? If you have that information available for us so that we can start reading a little bit about that, that would be wonderful. And also any strategies that we can implement as soon as we say, hey, hi, my name is so-and-so and here, we're gonna do this activity so I get to know you better. And then, you know, after that, we do the syllabus. But, um, but, but I think um, a lot of us wanna do so much we we are we believe in this process in, in the importance of equity um i know it from my personal experience many times i went through school not feeling hurt included and and i don't want my students to go through that pain but i don't know all the ways that i can ensure inclusion and and equity yeah, no, thank you for that. So a couple of things. We do assessments with the students probably once a year. Um, <laughs> they're probably surveyed out at this point, um, but not all students participate in those surveys. Let me first say that. And then two, even if I were to give you the data on that, you wouldn't be able to tie it to a student that would particularly be in your class. 
So, or in your area of service. So although we do share, so uh, the last NAC survey results that we shared from students, um, some of the things that they talked about was even feeling warm and having an understanding in the classroom. Um, misunderstandings around office hours or when the professor would even be available to interact with the students outside of the classroom. Those were things that hadn't been discussed openly and with clarifying points. Um, the other things that happened were pronouns. Students felt like um, they, their pronouns weren't respected. No one asked, asked them up front if they had a preferred pronoun. And even if they did share the preferred pronoun, it came out later, the professors or the instructors didn't acknowledge that and were using different pronouns for, for the students. So considering that. And the other piece were some of the things that you've heard today around the use of, I can't remember who, who mentioned the, the book that they were using within the class, but things like that. Students say, I'm not seeing myself in the resources that are provided. I'm not seeing people who look like me. The references that are made as far as career and goals, don't, they don't look like me, they don't share an identity similar to mine. And so I can't see that as a possibility for me. So that's discouraging for some of our students. The other thing is around microaggressions. Um, students, students have been victims of microaggressions in the classroom. There are statements that are being made, whether it's virtual or in person, that have been offensive. What I would encourage any person to do is get to know the classroom that you have or the students that you're serving within your area of service. And that could mean taking the opportunity before the class starts. I think I mentioned this in one of our um, other sessions. So also being present at the DEI workshop series, we give great tools and tips throughout the, throughout the series, not just, you know, we don't have the opportunity to do everything in one setting, but throughout the entire series, we, we switch it up. We do this in June and we do it in January where there are very helpful tools shared. Um, one of the things that we talked about was even possibly doing a video sharing before the semester begins. Once you have your roster, send a video out to your students to say, hi, my name is Professor um, Steinmetz and this is uh, my preferred pronouns are she, her, and hers. I identify as a black woman blah, 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 first generation college student, like I'm able to do these things. And I am so excited to be in the classroom with you. There are some things I'm not necessarily the best public speaker, but I am willing to learn giving an opportunity. This is my video to you all to welcome you. If you feel comfortable sending a video back, please do so. Tell me about your, your pronouns. Tell me about your identities. And then it would go to you directly as the instructor, not to the full class unless they wanted that, right? And giving that opportunity where now I'm learning more about who's going to be in the room, who's going to be in the room when we start to kick, up, kick off this semester. And so now I know how to approach it. So, so anyway, and then the other piece is, how do you best learn? What would make you feel included into this space? What can we do to make you feel more comfortable? Ask those questions within your video. And I'm just using that as an example. Um, it's something that I did for one of the sessions I was doing. Once I had the list of attendees, I sent something out. And I was like, hey, I'm looking forward to engaging with you. Tell me what you prefer. Tell me, and I wanna make sure that I can intertwine some of that within the teaching. It might not be every week, it might not be every session, but we'll be sure to include you in the process, right? And then they feel included in the process. So those are just some, some thoughts there. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, we're at, are we at our time? Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Um, did anyone else have thoughts? or things that they wanted to share in regard to um, engaging. So there was a question in regard, I'm sorry, um, since no one raised their hand or chimed in, I'm, I just wanna say this. There was a question in the chat just around the use of the term preferred before pronouns. And the reason we use that is because there are persons who literally opt out of, of sharing at all. Um, and so the way that that term is used is out of respect and an opening for all to contribute, as opposed to targeting one population of people to only share their pronouns if there is a difference. Um, so that's the reason that the preferred is used. 
You can choose to use it or not. You can just say, what are your pronouns? Um, or what pronouns do you associate with or would you like used here? The other thing that you can do is um, ask folks to, if we're talking about a Zoom room, if we're talking about WebEx or anything like that, you can ask persons to change their name um, in the box to their preferred name or what they would like to be referenced to within the course of within the time that you're together in the class. That's also helpful. So if their if their name doesn't necessarily match what's on your roster, to be respectful in that manner. Now I know what you like to be called or what you are, what you what you go by within your um, within this classroom. And I and I can be respectful of that and and articulate that. I hope that helps. Okay, I'm so I am so sorry. We are over time. Um, Elizabeth, can you stop sharing for just a moment, please? I just want to see everybody's face before we leave. <laughs> um, so the only other thing that I'll ask before you leave me today is if you have a moment, I, I have um, moved the Nearpod to the very final slide. Um, and if you have time after you get off or whatever, please chime in there to tell, tell us what else would you need support in as it pertains to your, your journey? Um, what areas would you like to see covered within workshops, within trainings, within sessions? We want to make sure that we can support you as a community so that you can be the best you um, and you can be the best you for our students. So I wanted to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being so open, so willing to engage, um, so willing to grow together in this space. It felt authentic. I hope you felt the same. I hope that we have learned from each other in this time. And I hope that you'll join us for some of the other sessions throughout this week. They are amazing. If you need a reminder, please refer to the email that I sent out on Friday. And let me know if you have any questions. I am always here to chat. Okay. Thank you all so much. <laughs>